Welcome to this week's podcast. Today we have two very, very special guests. We do. Dear friends of ours, yep. Billy and Sierra, who you may know from Tool is Endless Summer, another YouTube channel. And they have kindly agreed to allow us to interview them today. Which, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, very generous of them. And all I would say is that, you know, rather than just calling them Billy and Sierra, they're our mates. I said, dear mates. Okay, they are. You weren't listening to me, were you? (laughs) The attention span of a goldfish, once again. Yes, so welcome. Looking out the window, not paying attention. (laughs) Billy and Sierra, lovely to see you, and not forgetting Jetty. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us along, and it's good to see you guys too. Yeah. So, in these times of pandemic and us all being thrown to different corners of the universe, um, tell us about you, where you are, you know. So firstly, about who you are, for people who don't already know who Tula Zender Summer are, because everyone knows, but for those people that have been living in a box, tell us about yourself and where you are now. Uh, well, we. my name is Billy, this is Sierra, and we're on our uh, catamaran, a 1988 Crowther Spindrift uh, catamaran, and we have been cruising up and down the East Coast um, and through the Bahamas and through the Caribbean for the past two, almost three years now on this boat, and um, on an old trawler before that, and then... Uh, old small pocket cruiser monohull before that and uh, right now we are working our way back north through the Caribbean um, heading up to towards Florida and we're currently anchored in uh, St. Thomas kind of just at a standstill at the moment just with this whole pandemic thing going on and just trying to stay healthy and isolated and yeah, that's about. So that's in the US VR, right? That's in the, the US Virgin Exactly, Islands? yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I was in mm. uh, we were in St. Martin just before this. Um, we were checked in on the French side of St. Martin, and Sierra actually flew home to visit her family, and then that's just when this stuff started to get kind of crazy. So uh, I finished rebuilding our engine there in St. Martin, and then I sailed solo over here to St. Thomas, where Sierra was able to get a flight still uh, and meet back up with me. Yeah, so the original plan was for me to fly home and surprise my mom for her birthday. And this was before the U.S. had any cases, like um, China and Italy were having issues, but it wasn't a thing in the U.S., maybe one or two cases. So I got on a plane and I flew over, the plane was packed, tons of people, and then like three days into my trip, I got an email saying my flight was canceled because St. Martin is no longer accepting any um, anybody that's been to the U.S. within the past 14 days because within those three days our numbers went from like nothing to a couple hundred or whatever and we got put on a high risk list and so we had to come up with a different plan because I could not get back to the boat. And so yeah, plan B was the US Virgin Islands because it still is a territory and we figured you shouldn't have any problems checking in there and there should still be flights available and I was checking up to the last minute to make sure I was still able to go. And luckily that worked out, but the day after I got there, they shut off tourism. Like you can't get a hotel, you can't get an Airbnb and with that, nobody's flying in so they're canceling flights. So I just got in just in time. Just in time, yeah. (laughs) Wow. That must have been so stressful. I actually, yeah, I can totally sympathise because I, yeah, very nearly did not get back to the UK um, to be with with Nick, but we didn't have a boat to deal with either. So, you know, that that would have been another element of... Yeah. Congratulations that you're Mm. reunited. And I saw your engine rebuild. So... uh... You rebuilt it yourself? Yeah, yeah, I did. (laughs) So look, lucky enough, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. It's a 30 year old engine, an old Yanmar, and um, it's as simple as a diesel engine can get, right? It doesn't have any electronic parts or anything. And even even better for me, it had, uh, it originally comes with cylinder liners. So I could, I just popped out the old liners and put in new liners. Oh, and put that, new liners in, cool. Yeah, and that takes care of, you know, not having to hone, hone that and all that stuff. And then I bought new pistons and rings and so it was, it really wasn't too bad. It was tedious and nice. took a while, but not too bad. I learned a lot. And that was the whole reason we were in St. Martin, because that was the easiest place to get. We had, what did we do? We like rented out a part of a shipping container to get a bunch of parts shipped, so. Yeah, like less than full container shipment. And yeah, it was easy and cheap to get stuff shipped there. And then they did have machine shops and a ton, ton of resources if I needed uh, in St. Martin. So that was a good place to do it. Yeah, St. Martin's yeah. really handy so for that most, kind of thing. Yeah, the most important St. Martin question we have is, are they still doing $1 beers at Lagoonies? Yeah, they are. And, uh, and <laughs> Soggy Dollar. <laughs> That's amazing. I couldn't believe that, man. I was like, you yeah, can't find that yeah. anywhere in the U.S., maybe for like half a beer. 
Ah, uh, no. See, the $1 beer thing at Lagoonies is a massive... They're brilliant because if we'd sit and have three $1 beers and then we'd have a burger and then we'd be on the $6 beers and then it'd be 10 o'clock and I'd be covered in burger sauce and a bit of oh, beers down and have a massive credit card bill. Yeah, they get you every time. So I don't think that Lagoonies uh, haven't got it absolutely... But a big shout out to Lagoonies because we spent a good month yeah, um, you know, the in there listening to the live music. It's a pretty, pretty yeah. nice cruises resort. So before we, I want to come back to the COVID-19 issue and how it's affecting us cruisers, although we're not cruising at the moment, but you know, you guys particularly um, actually actively cruising right now. But first of all, I kind of want to take us back um, a few years to what made you decide to take this lifestyle on in the first place? Like, how did you decide to move onto a boat and go sailing? You guys are quite young still. Like, what made you make that decision? Well, you started it. Go for it. Yeah, I guess I guess with me out of college, I was looking to get into a teaching career possibly or I still I love traveling and adventure and water sports and stuff like that. So, as I was getting my foot in the door into a teaching career, I d decided that um I, I wanted to pursue other interests first before I got stuck into a career. So that's when I bought this old pocket cruiser sailboat and I started reading and researching about sailing and I wanted to go someplace warm where I can do water sports all year long and just enjoy warm, clear water all year long. And that's kind of what started it. So I fixed up this old sailboat and I left Long Island in November and I sailed down the coast and by the time I got to Florida I was out of money, I was lonely, I was cold, I was uh, so oh. so that's where I actually oh. <clears throat> <Where's yeah>. my <laughs> violin? <laughs> you do have a violin right here. <laughs> so yeah, I actually wasn't sure where I was gonna stop in Florida, but uh it turned out my engine the coupling on my engine, the flexible coupling actually broke um right in Jupiter and that's made my decision and I you know, I limped around the corner into this little tiny anchorage and I started walking around town looking for jobs and uh that's actually where I met Sierra and you know, we worked together at a kiteboard and paddleboard shop. Really? She was working there. Uh, she called all my references. Yep, I checked him out, made sure he was okay. <laughs> but we had, so we actually worked together for <laughs> oh, about a year before we, before we started dating. And then we started dating and then we started, I was kind of just sitting in that spot on the sailboat, you know, living on the mm. sailboat and working at the kite shop for a year. And then uh, he had it. Let me, let me put in a little info. He hadn't moved the sailboat that whole year we had worked together. And I think he was just so over the whole trip down because it you did it by yourself so it wasn't easy and yeah that's a long trip from new york down to uh down to yeah Florida. that's yeah, good on you yeah, yeah that's, that's really good, impressive good sailing, so. that's yeah great. so we would like have like little dates on tula and have like burgers and grill out and stuff and then one day like we actually went and we took your sister and your mom were there too and we went sailing and we went diving and then we had a plan to go to the Bahamas I was like Billy we got to go like I've been over there and it's the most amazing place so we tried to do that and we didn't end up making it we weren't as skilled sailing as we are now <laughs> and I don't think I ever moved <laughs> up after that <laughs> yeah yeah so then we went down we went sailing through the keys and then from there we just started sailing again and uh, uh, working seasonally still because we couldn't afford to sail full-time um, so we were working seasonally, we decided that if Sierra was going to be on the boat full time, we needed a bigger boat. And the the deal that kind of fell into our laps was this old trawler, um, this old diesel trawler. It wasn't a sailboat, but it was a cool boat. And we, we bought that. We sold Tula. We lived and fixed up the trawler for two years. And we just wanted to continue the lifestyle. So we... Uh, you know, we kept working seasonally, kept fixing up boats and, 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 and traveling in between. And yeah, and I was still in school at that time. I was in college, so I was the kid that like, like rode the dinghy to the dock, walked all the way to the car, drove the car to the gym, went to the gym so I could shower, and then went to school. So I, people got a nice little laugh out of that. <laughs> hey, do, well, do you know what? I, I yeah. love alternative lifestyles, and you know, it's worked out for you because you've got a, a, a booming YouTube channel, uh, you know, a very loyal following. And, um, you know, so, you know, congratulations on that, on, 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 you know, getting that off the ground. And all I would say is that obviously you have a lot of audience that are keen to follow your footsteps from America and kind of go, go soon. So do you have a, a message to people that aspire to your lifestyle? Oh, man. I, I think about this a lot, especially with the way that we did it and the way that I did it. And I think for some people, like, yeah, just, you know, buy an old beat up boat and fix it up and go but that's not good advice for some other people i think so if you're like that you're gonna do that anyway yeah i think my advice would be like 
I'm don't spend forever trying to fix everything because nothing is ever going to be perfect so you could be stuck at a dock or in a marina for years and years and years when you could have gone and like seen so many amazing things in that time I, I do true. I do have one piece of advice that I think applies for everyone it takes sacrifice um, whether it's like for me I remember the biggest sacrifice fixing up that first sailboat Tula was you know I, I couldn't go out partying with my friends every night of the week I had to go to sleep early because I had to wake up early and get stuff done on that boat and if I didn't do that it would have taken me two years instead of one year and then at that point your momentum slows who knows if I ever would have finished it so that's one thing definitely you know you got to sacrifice something or, or things to, to yeah. fulfill this lifestyle I agree yeah I, I think that one thing that I think perhaps you don't realize when you're watching uh, setting videos on YouTube or whatever is that you really have to want this lifestyle. Like it's not easy. You have to really, really want it because it's, it's hard. And uh, I think that unless you've got that real kind of passion for it, unless you really, really desperately want it, then um, it's gonna be too hard. And you're gonna get overwhelmed and yeah. yeah. I mean, interestingly, I mean, cause you've come from, was it New York you sailed out? Or yeah. That was your home port. So I, I came from the East coast of England from obviously a home port four or five thousand miles away and my friend Bo came from a home port in Alabama and then we were in in a marina in Charleston for six months and the common thing from everyone from all those marinas is if you look at the boats that are fixer uppers there are those people that are actually the minority that are fixing the boat up to leave and then the majority of them are fixing the boat up and you know they're never going to leave they're just it's just Fixing the boat or having having 10 or 12 jobs still less than before you can leave is just the excuse for never leaving. Because, and we've said this to a lot, we say this in our talks, and we've, we, we know that you talk about it and you and I, the four of us have talked about this privately. It takes the sacrifice you need to take and you've got to, you've got to work for it and you've got to give up a lot and you've got to understand, I and mean, for us as well, it scares you witless. Like before we gave up a career, a house, and everything, I was, you know, literally I'd lie awake at three o'clock in the morning going, what am I doing? I've got a perfectly good job. You know, we've got total security, but no, we're gonna get on a plastic boat and go and live somewhere else, you know, and it, it take it does take courage. So congratulations to both of you for joining, joining the few and the proud. Yeah, absolutely. It is a very worthwhile lifestyle. So you guys also um, took your dog with you. Uh, I think that was your dog to be with, Sierra, or was it? Yeah, she yeah. was. She was mine. I got her. Um, you were. We were working together, like right around the time. So Billy's known her since she was a puppy. But yep, she comes everywhere with us. She's right here. I don't know if you can see her. Please don't drag me into this. <laughs> She's a bit she, camera shy. <laughs> she likes to be involved <laughs> in stuff. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. After you know, you are. You are. So what's it like sailing with a dog? I mean, I think that we get a lot of questions about this as well, you know, oh, well, I've got a, a five-year-old dog or a 10-year-old dog and I really want to go sailing, but I'm not sure that, you know, taking a dog onto a boat really works. I think cats are a little bit different. People sail with cats and cats tend to be fairly, like, easy. But dogs, I don't know, I've got this kind of feeling that dogs are a bit more challenging. They're so definitely more... That. They're definitely more difficult. We were lucky because I, she's been on the boat forever um, and she's always been comfortable around water. She's a good swimmer, but the logistics of going into countries with the dog is very complicated. You have to like check in, check out, have a vet meet you in a new country, have a vet meet you before you leave a country, get permits and shots and everything before you even leave the States. Um, so it depends where you want to go. Like right now we could we're not planning to go to the South Pacific anytime soon unless we figure out a really, really good way to bring her because it just wouldn't be fair. So many countries don't let them off the boat or it's not like safe to bring her off the boat. Or, or... it's just, just huge quarantine periods yeah. and stuff like that. Same thing, even in the Caribbean, there are some islands or some countries that have big quarantine periods and, and we just skip those places. Um, I mean, it just, just having her aboard, it definitely makes it more challenging, um, but we wouldn't do it without her. And what about when you are sailing for several days at a time? Like, how do you deal with her? Because obviously when you're anchored off an island, you can take her ashore and take her for a walk and whatever. And how do you deal with it when she when you're offshore? Yeah, so we, we don't do too many, like, offshore passages. I think the longest we've been off is, like, three nights or four days or whatever. And if she has to go to the bathroom, she'll go on the trampoline. She'll wait because she doesn't like to because she knows this is her home. But if she has to go, she will. And for us, I think the hardest part about that was is 
learning that if she had to go, she was actually gonna go. Like, it used to break me my heart, like, oh, I've been to the bathroom so many times today and Jetty hasn't gone, until we started talking to vets and they're like, <laughs> dogs are different. If she has to go, she's gonna go. Don't worry about it. So every, every day we'll, you know, Two or three times a day, we walk her up to the trampoline. We walk, walk around, make sure, hey, if you got to go, it's right here. And she knows yeah. it. Okay, so she's gotten used to it. Yeah, and that's if we're on offshore. If we're, like, anchored like this, we take her off multiple times a day. There are people out there that keep their dogs on the boat. And for us, I just... Jetty likes to run. She likes to swim. So for us, I know it wouldn't be fair to her. And we could never do that um, just because... Yeah, she likes, she yeah. likes to adventure. Yeah. So, but yeah. some yeah, people it, do do that, so... Just depends on what you like. I think it depends on the dog. Yeah. And it depends on the owner. Yeah. Mm. And you know, there's. But you know, I, I, you know, we've met Jetty, so she said, you know. She, <laughs> she but, told us that she's really yeah, happy. Yeah, she, 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 <laughs> <rah, rah>, <laughs> So, um, U.S. Virgin Islands, we spent a, a couple of very happy months there. Um, or actually, because of legal requirements, we spent a very happy 29 days. Before our visa <laughs> ran out. Uh, that was a BBI. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so tell us about the vibe where you are. Tell us exactly where you're anchored. Let us know a little bit about what you can see out of your windows. Well, we're in uh, we're in Megan's Bay on the north side of St. Thomas right now. It's this big long bay. It's like a mile long, I think, maybe like a quarter mile wide, um, facing north west i guess um but it's real protected anchorage i guess uh some some like longer period swell can come in here but you know it, it's not bad it's pretty sheltered um and then megan's beach is right in front of us and that's this huge long world famous beach apparently we honestly haven't been even been on it because dogs are not allowed on that beach so we have this little tiny beach we've been going to and <laughs> running with jetty around on that little beach um what else is around us? But it, it's super calm right now. It's nice and sunny. The water is clear. There's tons of turtles like popping their heads out because there's a bunch of seagrass. So it's a really cool spot. We honestly haven't seen people in like seven well, days. Well, because there's we people. Just... Yeah, we haven't associated with people. In yeah, myself. there's a couple of other boats anchored out here, but it's not super crowded. <laughs> uh, nobody's really been going to the beach that we've been going to, and we're we're doing a really good job social isolating. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what are your plans? I mean, yeah. it's um, we, we're in April now. I mean, theoretically, you need to be north of uh, Cape Hatteras by 1st of July. Um, so what are you planning? Yeah, so our insurance, uh, we have been approved to be able to stay in Florida for hurricane season. Um, but we, I think, right now we're waiting to see if the Bahamas is going to open their borders anytime soon. Right now, I think they're closed and making another decision on like April 6th, because that's where we really would love to go um, and do a lot more filming and diving and fishing but I have a feeling that's gonna be extended. Um, so we're just gonna wait till that either opens up or Florida opens up the marinas and boat yards so we can get the boat hauled and do some work on the boat. Yeah, I mean, obviously we, we met you in um, in Hopetown in the Abacos a couple of years ago. And obviously the Abacos are still recovering from last year. You know, they got, yeah, so they've got- Hurricane Dorian. Yeah, so they've got mm. Dorian's damage to deal with and now COVID-19, so. I, I can <clears throat> I'm not sure we we don't we obviously have got a lot of friends in the Bahamas so um, obviously we're wishing the people of the Bahamas all the best but I can see that they've got a lot of issues to deal with because their infrastructure is probably still not up and running mm. yeah so it, and it's because so, we wanted to go there so bad because we had a group that we wanted to volunteer with and do some work on Hope nah, Town, because, in Hope Town actually yeah. so I don't know we want to do good but obviously we want to obey everyone's rules and regulations they're in place for a reason so we're just gonna sit and wait it out until we find out what's going on yeah I mean there's a I follow a lot of the sailing forums on the internet and a lot of people are saying that even moving a boat in these times is in some ways irresponsible because if they, if you have a problem you've got to get people to help you you know coast guard and other things and you're putting their lives at risk as well so i can kind of see both sides of the coin i think for people that have to move because of uh especially hurricane season yeah. you don't get a choice yeah and really in the same way that i imagine that the us and like the uk and the rest of the world is repatriating their citizens you are going to have to go back to the US. So, that, you know, provision has to be made because on the balance of what is best for you as American citizens, you need to go home um, at some point before the 1st of July. Yeah, which is how I can Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're, I mean, it, it's it's even tougher for some other people around here that we've been meeting. Like, I know, you know, a bunch of people are 
planning on spending hurricane season down in Grenada, but like all the islands down, including right. Grenada, are all closed. So now they're having to change plans. But some of them aren't U.S. citizens. So like like Ryan and Sophie, for example. Sophie's um, a French citizen with or, and, and Swedish. Swedish, but yeah. she can't. She doesn't have a visa for the U.S. So they can't. They don't know if they they can't really go to Grenada. They can't right. go to the U.S. So. Look, I, I think the world is, a, you know, and is, is a very strange place at the moment. And realistically speaking, there is a certain amount of, oh, boo-hoo, um, you know, you can't go anywhere in your yacht, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think really, for, 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 from our point of view, it, it's, it's uh, you know, there are, there are bigger fish uh, to fry. Yeah, and I think, you know, we're talking to um, Yosh and Benita from Selling Nanji the other day. And as I said to them, you know, when this was all kind of starting out, there was this, uh, I guess, kind of feeling that people who were on their boats were going to weather this better than us on land because, you know, it, there's this perception that uh, cruisers have this freedom. But I feel like the reality now is that actually cruisers have even less freedom in a lot of ways than people who are land-based right now because you got, like, people, people think that when you're living off-grid, you are totally disconnected from a lot of elements of society. But I think actually... The opposite is kind of true, particularly in these situations, because you really are relying on, you know, kind of bureaucracy working in your favour, on having access to certain facilities and amenities, and it can, you know, if, if things are getting shut down, then it leaves cruisers in a, in a real pickle. That, it's so true, yeah, like, just strictly speaking, I, being isolated is fine, but yeah, as soon as you need, need something. something, or you need protection from the weather, or, you know, it's, yeah, you, it's, it's a tough situation it's it's not so easy um but like nick said you know like you said nick it's you know boo hoo uh, we can make do there's people you know dying in the cities and stuff like that so but still it is it's not what people think sometimes like having all this freedom on a sailboat it, it is like right. it's it's kind of scary going ashore and getting you know trying to get resources or provisions or whatever and especially for the people that aren't in their Absolutely. home country like when their visa runs out this country is allowed to not regrant their visa and if there's nobody else around them that's allowing people to come in like where the heck do they go yeah absolutely yeah. yeah we've heard loads of stories about people literally being kicked out of a country and literally having nowhere else to go because they cannot i mean sailing obviously you have to follow you know the weather and you can't sail upwind particularly not if you're thinking about crossing oceans or anything like that so people who are in the middle of already in the middle of nowhere and on some random island like in the middle of the indian ocean and yeah, they're getting kicked out. Like, where do you go from there? It's it's super tough. It, I've, I think a lot of people are going to be in a really sticky situation. And as you say, you guys are at least uh, on, like, American soil. I know the USVIs aren't, I guess, strictly American, but the, they're in American territory. And so you do have, you know, that kind of um, security yeah. to a large extent. Just tell us a little bit about um, how self-sufficient are you on, on the boat, actually, at the moment? Like, how reliant are you on, on shoreside amenities? We're we're pretty good. We haven't had to. We haven't gone to a dock in months, right? Yeah, uh, and that's all thanks to we got a new water maker. Um, so that's really been helping us. Um, we went grocery shopping like maybe eight days ago. But if we really had to, obviously, yeah, we could fish and we could catch whatever we needed. And we have solar panels, so. The only thing we really, really need is gas for the generator to run the water maker. Right. And food. Yeah. yeah. But and we, food. I mean, we're stocked up enough right now where we could last, I mean, on, we could probably last like two months. Probably about two months with all the food we have on board and the amount of gasoline we have on board, which it doesn't take a lot. So, um, and well, then, that's paper. just... Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of seaweed out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I, 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 I saw, think he's going for a swim over I there. saw that gag in Annapolis. It's not a pretty one. Uh, okay. So you are, what, a four-day sail from Florida? Like downwind, are you? Probably a little bit longer. Maybe a Probably like six. six or seven. Straight okay. shot, yeah. So a week offshore, you'd be home. But it's downwind. Oh, yeah, so, you easy. Know, uh, yeah. Nice. That's pretty cool. Um, and so, just one couple of final questions. Your, both your families are okay? They are, yeah. So, my family's in Florida. Um, they're doing fine. I think my dad's not working right now. My mom's a principal at an elementary school. So, for some reason, they still have principals going into work. And your mom is in Florida, and so is Catherine. But Billy's dad and brother are in New York 
Well, yeah, my brother's in the city, so I, I'm a little worried about him because he's got they got a big dog that they right. have to take out and walk every day. And New York City sounds like it's just like a war zone right now, yeah. kind of like I know he, he sent, it looks absolutely horrific. Yeah, he sent me a picture like you know a mile away of the tents that they're setting up out outside the yeah. hospital for the you know just the extra capacity. So it was a little scary, yeah. but they're fine for now. So hopefully, you know, right. hopefully everyone stays healthy. Absolutely. We'll give them all our best. I mean, your yeah. dad, your dad is one of our biggest fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. He is actually the one that introduced us to you guys. So way to go, Mr. Yeah. Sweezy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So William Sweezy Senior. Um, uh, <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> hello from us. So I hope you enjoyed that podcast. That was an interview with our friends Billy and Sierra of Tula's Endless Summer. Check them out on their YouTube channel, Tula's Endless Summer. They're on Instagram and they've got a new podcast as well. We'll put all the links down below for that one. Now, we will be back again, won't we? Yes, definitely. With more podcasts dealing with a variety of different sailing subjects, interviews with friends of ours and other sailors. So stay tuned and we'll see you again. Goodbye. Goodbye.